It's the Sunday Connect and Grow Hour here at Christ Church Fraser, and I'm glad you've chosen to join us this morning. Uh, today we're going to look at a topic that is essential to becoming and living as a Christian, and that topic is faith. And since you've chosen to watch this video, you probably have some thoughts on what faith is about, but I'm pretty sure that uh, there are differing ideas among you that are watching, uh, some right and maybe some that are not so right. Hopefully when this lesson is uh, concluded, you'll come away with a fresh insight on faith, a word that we find referred to frequently in scripture. Some of you may remember Reverend Eric Worley, uh, who was the pastor of our church for about 26 years from the late 60s to the uh, mid 90s. Uh, he told a story that I'll always remember, and I think maybe I've shared this story before, but I think it really fits well here. The story is about a children's Sunday school class whose teacher asked the group, what is faith? At first, there was just silence there in the classroom. So the teacher asked again, what is faith? Well, finally, a little girl raised her hand and answered, faith is believing something you know is not true. Now, you might chuckle at her answer, or you may be shocked, but I think there likely is um, a good number of adults who claim to be Christians that might give a similar answer, or at least think that way. If you're not sure how you would answer that question, maybe after our class today, you'll be better equipped to do that. The title of our study is, The Church is to Demonstrate Faith. And our scripture readings will include portions of chapters 11 and 12 in the book of Hebrews. We're going to focus on three aspects of faith. The definition of faith, the approval of faith, and the endurance of faith. So please open your Bible to the book of Hebrews, which is found near the end of the Old, uh, New, correction, New Testament, just before the uh, book of James, and find chapter 11, where we'll read just verses 1 and 2 verses 1 and 2 in Hebrews chapter 11, to, to learn about the definition of faith. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. If uh, asked what faith is, what answers would you expect an average person uh, might give? Maybe belief, uh, religion, following rules, uh, commitment, acceptance, devotion. Well, certainly some of those words do apply, but none of them would really measure up to what we find there in verse 1. In the version that I was reading from, uh, appears the words sure of and certain. In other translations, we find words like confidence, assurance, conviction, substance, evidence, reality, and proof. These are strong words that imply another important aspect of faith, and that is trust. I once heard a description of faith that I think is helpful, and I've shared it with others, and it's based on the acronym CAT, spelled with a K, K-A-T. K is for knowledge. We have to know, we have to be informed, be aware of something or some event or some claim that it exists. A is for acceptance or assent. We have to choose to believe it, that it is true, to agree with it. And then T is for trust. We have to rely or commit ourselves to it. Now, for example, your doctor prescribes a new medication after diagnosing some condition that you have. So now you know about it, 
but will that make, make you feel better? Well, no. Suppose then that you choose to believe that the doctor has told the truth and you buy the medication. Will that make you well? No. What do you still have to do? You have to trust the doctor's judgment and take the medication in the correct dosage. Well, similarly in the spiritual realm, we have to know what God has revealed in his word. We have to accept that it is true and then trust him with our lives, obeying what he says, even though we may not see it come to pass when we expect it. This is not an easy thing to do. And in fact, it's not even possible if we only rely on our own ability, our own power. We hear expressions like, keep the faith, or have a little faith, or maybe your faith will get you through this. But faith is not something that we automatically have just because we're human beings. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And then in Philippians 1.29 he writes, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And then in 2 Peter verse 1, in, uh, chapter 1 and verse 1, he writes, To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. And then in Acts 3.16, we find the faith that comes through Jesus. So it is God who gives us the gift of faith. But the question is, how can we obtain it? It's a matter of submission, yielding to the invitation, the drawing of the Holy Spirit by humbly opening our hearts to him. Or putting it another way, opening our hands, opening our hands to receive the gift of faith that he offers. Now there's something else to consider about what faith is not. This is important because there are those who try to use a philosophical ploy to get people to reject faith and ultimately reject God. They seek to redefine faith as a way of knowing, a method of determining what is true. This is not what biblical faith is. But for those Christians who just believe what they've been told to believe, this ploy can be a huge stumbling block. Those who aim to destroy faith will seek to redefine it as belief without evidence or pretending to know things you don't really know. This tactic can be effective when confronting other religions like Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, or Mormonism, but not Christianity. Well, why is that? Because only Christianity has the truth, the evidence, to back up the claims of faith. Biblical Christianity does not use faith to discover knowledge. Instead, Christian faith is the response to knowledge gained by other means. Let me repeat that. Biblical Christianity does not use faith to discover knowledge. Instead, Christian faith is the response to knowledge gained by other means. So we can see why that K in the acronym CAT is so important. We have to have the knowledge, the reasons to build our faith on that comes with study. It takes time. It takes effort. How many of us are willing to invest the time and the effort to be equipped with a strong faith to serve God and to live as overcomers.
Well, that's a lot to think about. We've only covered one verse. Looking at uh, verse 2, we find a reference to the ancients, or in other translations, you'll see the words ancestors or people of old, elders. These are the biblical characters listed in the remainder of chapter 11, who had the faith that's described in verse 1. And how were they thought of? They were commended, given a good report or approval. And that's what we're going to look at next. Now that we know more about the definition of faith and what it isn't, let's find out about the approval of faith. Verses 3 through 31 in chapter 11 describe a, a number of well-known biblical characters who exhibited great faith, which I hope you'll read about on your own. But to save some time, let's drop down to verse 32 there in chapter 11 and begin reading 32 through verse 40. And, I want, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdom, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. If when you read verses 4 through 31, you'll see mention about 10 individuals or groups that demonstrated faith in some measure during their lives, which serve as examples to motivate us to live by faith as well. Now in verse 32, we see listed six more names plus a reference to the prophets. Sometimes we'll see this chapter referred to as the Hall of Faith or the Faith Hall of Fame. Well, we find not only amazing accomplishments in that passage we just read, but also significant suffering that results from living an obedient life of faith. This is a good description of what we should expect ourselves if we're seriously putting our faith into action. God is not trying to hide what his faithful followers should expect. Jesus tells us to count the cost. There in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, he says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And then later in Luke 14, verses 28 and 33, Jesus says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? For whoever, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. But let's remember that, what we, that the promise that we have that there is a cost uh, to consider before making the choice to follow Christ, what we receive in return will be well worth it all, by far. We read in Hebrews 11:6, without faith it's impossible to please him, 
For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Paul writes in Philippians 4, in verse 19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And James writes in chapter 1, in verse 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. But what makes these people of faith mentioned here in chapter 11 so special is described in there in verse 39. They remained faithful, yet none of them received what? That which had been promised. Does that mean that God was not faithful to them? No, it means that he was waiting until just the right time in his perfect plan to fulfill those promises. And why did God wait for the right time, according to verse 40? First, God had planned something better for us, and that was the demonstration of his love by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to be born as one of us, to die on the cross, and then rise again to new life. But also, those believers in the Old Testament will be made perfect together with us because of what Christ has done and what he will do when he comes again. They were commended or approved because of their patient faith in what God had promised. Notice how in verse 2 of chapter 11 and verse 39, use that word commended, or in other translations, the word approved. These Old Testament believers received the approval of faith. So far, we've learned about the definition of faith and the approval of faith. Let's see what we can find out about the endurance of faith in our last passage in Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll read verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There's a lot to unpack here in verse 1, so let's look at some of the words that are used here in detail, but not necessarily in the order that they're given to us. First, we see the expression, run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Does this remind you of an athletic event, something like you uh, might see in the Olympics? But the word Perseverance reminds us that our race as Christians is not like a sprint, but like what? A marathon. We're in this for the long haul. And as a marathon runner has to keep a different pace from a sprinter, we need to be prepared to live a lifetime of faith in Christ so that what we will need to do is what? Well, still in verse 1, we need to throw off. Throw off what? Everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. People in the day when Hebrews was written wore robes or tunics. But all runners in a race would be hindered by these kinds of clothes. So they would all have a common need to remove them. But each runner would have individual challenges that may be different from the others. Maybe some had a difficult time 
uh, restricting their diet. Others may have found it hard to put in the hours of training every day. While still others may have had trouble with their feet or ankles getting sore. As Christians, we all have a common need to clear our minds of other concerns to be prepared for worship, for Bible study, for prayer. But what about that sin that so easily entangles? That's not going to be the same for each of us. What causes me to mess up will be different from what you have to deal with. So how do we conquer these sins? Verse 1 tells us we're surrounded by what? A great cloud of witnesses. Well, who are these witnesses and how do they empower us to throw off what hinders and the sin that entangles? You'll likely encounter some who claim that these witnesses are the believers in heaven who are watching us all the time, clapping and cheering us on as we are living faithfully for God. And in my Bible, there's actually a footnote that makes that claim. But I have to say, I just do not agree with that idea. We have nothing in Scripture that I know of that tells us that those who have died as Christians watch what we're doing here on earth. According to some of the commentaries I read, the word witnesses in Greek is martus or martis. And it's described as one who has information or knowledge of something and can bring to light or confirm something. So these witnesses are not spectating, but rather are testifying. They're not witnesses of us. They're witnesses to us. Their lives in the past encourage us now to press on, to persevere, to stay strong. Well, back in the last part of verse 4 in chapter 11, we find that Abel, as who we know was the son of Adam and Eve, still speaks even though he is dead. How is that to be understood? It is an exemplary a demonstration of faithfulness recorded in Scripture that encourages us to, to do the same. So besides the examples of these faithful believers of old, how else do we conquer our sin that so easily entangles? Verse 2 tells us to fix our eyes where? On Jesus. And in verse 3, to consider him. There's an old saying you might have heard that goes something like, don't just tell God how big your problem is, tell your problem how big your God is. I think that's, that's good advice. But I would add to that, tell God how big your God is. Praise Him. Glorify Him. Honor Him. Exalt Him. That's how we fix our eyes on Jesus, to consider Him. But what else do we find there about Jesus in verse 2? He's the author and perfecter of our faith. Other versions translate author as pioneer, founder, originator, or source. You might remember my comment earlier about Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 that it is God who gives us the gift of faith. Well, here in verse 2, we find that same thought that Jesus is the originator or author of our faith, the faith by which we are saved or justified. But Jesus is also the perfecter of our faith or finisher, completer. Jesus doesn't just get us saved or justified. He seeks to get us perfected or sanctified, conformed to his image. And this is the growth part of faith, the part where we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, and the part where we put to use our spiritual gifts, 
that we read about in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and Ephesians chapter 4. Have you ever seen a sign with the letters B-P-W-M-G-I-N-F-W-M-Y? It stands for, Be patient with me. God is not finished with me yet. It's a reminder to others to, to realize that we're still being perfected. We're being completed. We still don't get everything right. But it's also a good reminder to ourselves about others that we think ought to be further along in their walk with Christ, that we need to be patient with them. But what else do we learn about Jesus, the one who we fix our eyes upon in verse 2? We learn that he endured the cross for what reason? The joy set before him. We might wonder, how could there be any joy associated with the cross? Well, actually, there wasn't. We also read that he scorned its shame. But it was what came after the cross that was a joy to him. His resurrection and ascension into heaven where he would be reunited with the Father and receive back the glory that he had before being born as a human being. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And then also in John 17, verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. That was the joy that was set before Jesus that enabled him to endure the horrible death on the cross. And what followed the, his death, his resurrection and ascension into heaven in verse 2? We're told he sat down at the right hand of God. Why is it important to know that he sat down. It's because his work was finished. He came to earth and did everything perfectly that the Father wanted. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. It was a cry of victory, of triumph. Well, finally, in verse 3, Jesus not only endured the cross, mentioned in verse 2, but he also endured the opposition of sinful men. Those same sinful men that he prayed for while on the cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Why are we told to consider him who endured this? So that we will not grow weary and lose heart. So we will be able to endure, to have the endurance of faith. In just a few days, we will be celebrating Good Friday, the day that Jesus was crucified on the cross. Some may wonder, how can it be called Good Friday when what happened there was so bad? Though it was terrible what happened with Jesus, it was good very, very good what happened with us. He took on himself the penalty for our sin and gave us his righteousness in return. And what is our responsibility and privilege as Christ's church? As the title of our study today says, the church is to demonstrate faith. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the gift of faith that you have given to us, that we can gain approval and have the endurance that you desire for us. Help us to consider Jesus during this holy week and help us to remember to be grateful to, for all the things that he has done. 
to continue to, to do and what he will continue to do for us. Thank you for the witnesses that we read about in, in Scripture that led the way and help us to have the faith as they did. Help us to share that faith so that others can know Jesus as Savior, the author and perfecter of faith. We ask these things in his name. Amen. <laughs>